When you start learning things about ancient Egypt, you might find that you can't stop. It's a slippery slope, and once the fascination bug has bitten you, it may never let go. The ancient Egyptians were one of the most fascinating civilizations ever to walk the face of the earth, but there's still so much that we either don't know or don't understand about them. And we'll share some of those great unknowns in this video. The Egyptians had an astonishingly good grasp of mathematics. You can see that in the Akmem wooden tablets, which are also known as the Cairo wooden tablets. This pair of wooden writing tablets are both covered in arithmetical problems and have survived the passing of the years because they've been coated in plaster to preserve their contents. Helpfully, a date is included on one of the tablets, so we know the inscriptions were made in the year 38. Both tablets feature a list of the names of servants, followed by a series of mathematical puzzles. So it's possible that the puzzles were set for the servants as a means of verifying that they were fit to serve. If so, it was a very high barrier to entry. One of the questions involving division is so complicated that the answer wasn't proven to be correct until 1906. More recent examinations have revealed minor computational mistakes in some of the equations, including two references to 2 multiplied by 7 equaling 13. But perhaps those errors were made by people who never got the honor of becoming servants. You might be aware that the ancient Egyptians believed in crystal healing of the kind practiced by holistic New Age healers today. What you might not be aware of is that the Egyptians also practiced a method of healing involving sound. They called it toning, and it involved the manipulation of spoken vowel sounds and breathing to create so-called therapeutic sounds. They even built special resonating structures, within which these sounds could be amplified to enhance their supposed healing effects during religious ceremonies. John Stuart Reed, an acoustician and Egyptologist, believes the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid of Giza was designed to be such a structure. But many more examples of acoustic healing venues can be found along Egypt's Band of Peace. Reed says his own lower back pain was temporarily alleviated while he conducted sound experiments within the pyramid. It's also been pointed out that the Bent Pyramid of Sneferu has two chambers that produce two different sound frequencies, and that this probably isn't a coincidence. Did the Egyptians master the art of sound engineering in a way that we can barely imagine to be possible? It's probably fair to say that people who lived 100 years ago didn't understand mental health conditions and the importance of looking after mental health as much as we do today. However, it's also probably fair to say that the ancient Egyptians may have understood mental health better than the people of the 19th or early 20th centuries. The Ebers Papyrus makes it clear that the Egyptians understood that mental functions depend on the health of the brain. They even had psychiatrists, although back then the role they filled and performed was more akin to a sorcerer. Royal sorcerers were chosen at birth and spent their whole lives wearing masks as a means of representing their detachment and transparency. The mask also meant that the psychiatrists couldn't be identified out in the streets, as they were entrusted with many great personal secrets. Even the traditional czar dance, which is still performed in rural Egypt today, is a form of group psychotherapy designed to encourage participants to express their feelings through dance. The fact that sorcerers were encouraged to take hallucinogenic drugs to improve their ability to heal mental illnesses may not have been ideal, but some treatments that we still use today can be traced to these Egyptian roots. It wouldn't be untoward to suggest that no ruler in history changed a civilization so completely as Akhenaten did during his 20-year rule of Egypt 3,300 years ago. The period is known as the Amarna Age and saw drastic changes in Egyptian art, language, art, and architecture that would shape the next thousand years. What inspired Akhenaten to make such profound changes? The sun. It was Akhenaten who introduced the Aten sun disk to the Egyptian people and told them it was a god. It was he who ordered the construction of the city of Amarna in the empty desert as a way of pleasing his sun god. Modern experts have recently been able to demonstrate that many of the biggest things Akhenaten did were done at the time of solar eclipses. Even the Akhet symbol, 
which is synonymous with the Amarna Age, has been interpreted by some as a depiction of a solar eclipse. Donald Redford, an expert in the Amarna Age, says Akhenaten introduced a whole new art style to Egypt in the year 1351 BCE. Coincidentally, there was a total solar eclipse that year that would have been visible in southern Egypt. Or perhaps that was no coincidence at all. In May 2018, a new study was carried out on a 1,500-year-old papyrus manuscript that was found close to the pyramid of Senesret I in 1934. The papyrus is significant because it contains references to several events mentioned in the Bible. Some of those references corroborate what's written in the Bible, but others differ wildly. One of them is the story of the biblical figure of Isaac. The Christian Bible states in Genesis 22, 2-18 that God commanded Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac as a burnt offering, only to spare him at the last moment and reveal that the instruction was a test of his faith. The papyrus, however, says that Isaac was indeed sacrificed. This concurs with versions of the same tale in other ancient religious texts, which suggests that it may be one of many revisions that were made to the Bible before it arrived in its current King James form. Scientific analysis suggests that the papyrus was written by a professional scribe during the 6th century. By then, versions of the Old Testament would have existed for several centuries. What's the true origin of the tale, and why is there such a crucial difference? In February 2022, academics and Egyptologists completed a study of some 3,400-year-old tablets known as the Amarna Letters. Among the many conclusions they reached after studying the letters is that an ancient dagger found inside the tomb of Tutankhamun by Howard Carter in 1922 may not be as Egyptian in origin as we've always assumed it to be. The dagger has always been thought to be an unusual artifact for its era because it has an iron blade. But the Iron Age had not yet begun, and humans of the time didn't understand how to heat iron to a sufficient temperature to smelt it. Instead, it was thought that the dagger was probably made by pounding metal found inside a meteorite. That theory was confirmed by scientific analysis in 2016. According to the contents of the Amarna letters, the dagger was gifted to Tutankhamun's grandfather by the king of Mitanni decades before Tutankhamun was even born. If it was the king of Mitanni's possession to give away, the dagger must be Syrian in origin rather than Egyptian. It's likely that many of the objects in Tutankhamun's tomb were hand-me-downs of this kind. The stele of Ankh Fn Khonsu is an artifact that's quite a mouthful, which might be why it's also known as the stele of revealing. Unusually for an ancient Egyptian stele, it's made of wood rather than stone. The artifact was discovered by François-Auguste Ferdinand Mariette within the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut in Dair al-Bari in 1858. The archaeologist correctly identified it as an offering stele, originally created for a Montu priest by the name of Ankh F. N. Khonsu. Historians agree that it was created somewhere between the years 680 and 670 BCE. The stela might not look like it's made from wood, but that's because it's been entirely covered with a plaster gesso and then painted. The priest Ankh F. N. Khonsu himself appears on the front of the artifact, depicted presenting offerings to Re Harakati, the falcon-headed god. A depiction of the sky goddess Nut can be seen directly above him. Excerpts from chapters 2, 30, and 91 of the Book of the Dead are inscribed across the stela for unknown reasons. Also unknown is the reason that the object ended up in the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut. The most famous pyramids in Egypt are the ones in Cairo, but they're far from the only pyramids in Egypt. It's just that they're larger and in better condition than almost all of the others. As an example, here's what's left of the Pyramid of Senseret II in Cahun. The pyramid was built 3,800 years ago, while Senseret was still alive, which meant he could give it a name. Somewhat immodestly, he called it Ka Senseret, which means Senseret Shines. Curiously, he chose to have his pyramid built in Cahun, rather than Dashur, which is where the pyramid of his father, Amenemet II, is located. That's a significant break from a tradition that was already well established by that point. 
and historians aren't sure for the reason for it. He also hid the entrance to the pyramid in an unusual place. Rather than being on the north face of the pyramid, which was standard for Old and Middle Kingdom pyramids, Senusret had the entrance concealed beneath the tomb of a princess buried a few hundred feet away. It's been speculated that this may have been a measure to guard the pyramid against grave robbers, but that's just a theory. Since we're talking about ancient Egyptian mysteries, let's talk about one of the biggest ones. There's a hatch or a hole on the top of the head of the Sphinx, and nobody wants to tell the world where it leads to. In fact, very few archaeologists want to talk about the idea that there are rooms inside the Sphinx at all. The hole can clearly be seen in old pictures of the sculpture, but appears to have been filled in more recently. It's likely that very few people knew it was there at all, until aerial photography became possible. Even now, it's illegal to photograph the Giza Plateau from above, which is a sure sign that there's something there that the authorities don't want people to see. Researcher Robert Schock claims to have seismic data that clearly indicates the existence of hollow chambers inside the Sphinx, and an underground tunnel that leads from the Sphinx to the Great Pyramid. Zahi Hawass has even produced a video that appears to show him accessing the chambers through a hatch and discovering a sarcophagus. Although his testimony is disputed and he now refuses to discuss his video, what's really inside the Sphinx and why aren't we allowed to know? Almost every civilization in the world has legends about giants who once lived and walked among them. But might a giant once have been the king of Egypt? Perhaps we can find out by studying the remains of King Sanakht, a third dynasty pharaoh who ruled Egypt around 4,700 years ago. His remains were found inside a tomb close to Bait Kalaf in 1901, and are remarkable because of their size. Based on his skeleton, the pharaoh was around 6 feet and 6 inches tall. The average height of a human male during that time was more like 5 feet and 6 inches, so to the people around him, Sanakht would have appeared to be a giant. Even Ramses II, who history records as being tall, only reached 5 feet and 9 inches. Analysis of the pharaoh's bones has confirmed that he had giganticism, and so would have appeared even larger than he was. He's the earliest known human to have had this medical condition. Might all the other contemporary accounts of giants from the era have referred to people with giganticism too? Or were there other giants to be found in ancient times aside from this towering king? Humans have gazed up at the stars in wonder ever since our time on this planet began, but no civilization ever seemed as fascinated with the heavens as the ancient Egyptians. That's best illustrated by the ceiling of the tomb of Senenmut, an Egyptian architect and government official from around 1,500 years BC. Upon that ceiling is what's come to be known as the Egyptian Celestial Diagram, which contained a full map of the stars and constellations seen exactly as they appeared thousands of years ago. What baffled scientists for years was the positioning of Orion to the west of Sirius, rather than the east. After extended study, we now know that the Egyptians worked out north and south according to the position of the sun, rather than the Earth's magnetic poles, of which they'd have had no knowledge. That solves a part of the mystery, but we still don't know how the Egyptians mapped the stars so accurately without telescopes or technology, nor why they constructed the pyramids to be in perfect alignment with Orion's belt. What did they know that we don't? It's becoming increasingly common knowledge that there are secret chambers hidden in the Great Pyramid of Giza. In September 2020, explorers identified two secret doors hidden inside the pyramid. They're at the end of a pair of narrow tunnels that extend from the north and south walls of the Queen's Chamber inside the pyramid, and then stop at stone blocks before they reach the outer walls. There isn't enough space in the tunnels for a human to explore them, but a robot called Webwawat was sent into the space and obtained pictures of a small stone door, with what appears to be two copper handles attached to it. The same robot also took pictures of faint red hieroglyphs painted onto the walls. The hieroglyphs are rough, almost like graffiti, so it's possible that they are guide marks left behind by the stonemasons who built the pyramids. It's also possible that they are hieratic numerical signs recording the length of each shaft, 
These shafts can't have been used for ventilation because they don't open up to the exterior of the pyramid, but they're surely too small for humans to have been expected to navigate them. Building a door implies that there's something worth protecting behind it, though. What could it be? Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching, and see you soon.